Okay, we'll we'll get started. Scano swagwego deo andata ni giaso o tahione ne wagi shoutet ganyet kiono ni wakwensadet. Um, it's really nice to see folks and to, to see so many folks who work at Polytech and, and others who are able to, to make their way in. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I introduced myself in Gaiokono and uh, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to learn language here in our community. I think probably most of you know, but I'll say it anyway. Um, this is the only place in the world where the Cayuga language is actively used and um, has a solid home, although we know that that, um, that base is shrinking, uh, but I'm grateful that Polytech and other entities in the community are working so hard to, um, to revitalize it so that the language continues to flourish, as well as our other languages. Obviously, of course, Gonyangkeha, which is the original language of my nation, um, as well as Onondaga and Seneca and um, Oneida and Tuscarora, and I think too there's some interest, although I'm not quite sure how effective it is here yet, but there's definitely work going on on revitalizing the Lenape language as well. And um, I know that our community is committed to supporting that in, in any way possible, and I'm very grateful that Polytech has invested so much in particular in, in that revitalization. Um, I also, given the times that we're in, um, as an academic, I feel it's important to um, disclose <laughs> identities in maybe a more broad way than um, we might typically have done, you know, a couple years ago. Um, but many of you who know me know this anyway, so I'm born to a woman not from our community. Um, she was uh, primarily from settler ancestry in the States, uh, origin like drawing originally from um, the Ukraine. Um, but actually, via, like originally from Germany via the Ukraine. I come from a long line of peasants, basically, um, on my mom's side and then um, <clears throat> on my father's side here at Grand River um, with lineage as well from Ghana's Adage. So um, I come from a multicultural Haudenosaunee family and um, my husband's family is from Oneida of the Thames and my children are also from Grand River through um, their adopted, but their family lineage biological is Seneca from here at Grand River. So we're a multi-nation Haudenosaunee home <coughs> with some chlorine in the gene pool. Although it doesn't help in the ways that one would hope in terms of health sometimes. So um, yes, yeah, so Tanis asked me to speak about um, treaty essentials. So it's gonna be a lot of basic info. Many of you are gonna know quite a bit of this, but hopefully um, the way I tie it together will help to spark your own memory so when you're telling others um, about these things, when they come up in conversation, there'll be extra info there for you to draw upon. And I focused it primarily around what I consider Haudenosaunee Treaty Essentials, but also recognizing that um, there's way more to cover than can be done in an hour. And also um, my expertise is, is fairly particular um, and I'll speak to that as I'm going through some of the points I wanted to share. Uh, we know that treaties are popular this week in Ontario. Um, I actually thought it was last week because my husband got called in to do all kinds of stuff for the Peel District School Board. So I thought, oh, it must be treaty week. Um, <laughs> it should be every week. Well, you know what, it is. They just don't like to talk about it, right? They like to keep it in a nice little box that they only have to parade out once a year. Um, but yes, it's our job to remind them that it is every day, every week, every month of every year. Um, so, so I tend to break treaty relationships into four broad categories. And I think these are useful. Others might have a more nuanced way to do this, but I think these are four basic categories that help to break things um, up and, and put them in little baskets that are maybe a bit easier to understand. Um, first and foremost, particularly as Haudenosaunee people, um, as a people from multiple nations who join together in our confederacy, we have what I call internal treaties. Others might not use this term, but I think it is a helpful way 
to think about the great law, at least for me, and hopefully some of you will find that as well. It's really, when I'm talking about internal treaties, it's primarily about the great law. Then there are internation treaties, and I, I like to talk about this in particular because sometimes we get caught up in the idea that the only treaties that exist are the treaties we have with, um, with settler people, but that's not at all the case. We have a long legacy of treaty making and treaty relationship with other indigenous peoples, and um, there's certainly an active movement to continue that and to even expand that in certain circumstances amongst our, our leaders. <clears throat> the more famous of the treaties that most of us tend to hear about are our indigenous European treaties, our, and particularly our Haudenosaunee and European treaties. And for us, those treaties exist with the Dutch, the French, and the English who, during our treaty relationship, became the British. Um, and I don't bother to list Canada because uh, in case you didn't check, the Queen's still on the, the 20, even though she's dead. Uh, Lord, I'm not looking forward to the time when Charles's picture starts replacing those things. But that's a whole other story. And then um, also in this part of the world, we also know that there's a legacy of land cession treaties. We also know that that's the situation in our homelands territories, right? Um, <clears throat> in what's now considered New York State. But I'm not going to talk a lot about land cession treaties, particularly because they're less relevant for us as Oswego Hono. Um, we don't have land cession treaties for this territory. Uh, doesn't mean that we're not party to other land cession treaties and that we don't have a relationship around some of those things as well. I work in Toronto after all. I get to hear about it all the time. So um, I wanted to start with planting an idea in people's minds. You're more than welcome to disagree with me, but I like to think of the original instructions that we, that we received um, at the time of creation as our first treaty. Um, there's lots of talk about how treaties are sacred, and when we think about this idea of the original instructions, there's probably nothing more sacred to us, right, in terms of those things that we were told at the time of creation that we were expected to uphold as a means of getting to live and enjoy this life and the bounty of creation. So to me, when we do Gnohanyo and reminding ourselves about our dependence on the natural world, reminding ourselves of the lessons of the creation story we are upholding those obligations that the Creator set down for us. And what He told us when He was done making this place was that all you have to do is to be respectful of all of these things around you that sustain your life and enjoy it. Uh, we're pretty good at the enjoying part most of the time. Um, <laughs> Sometimes we're not as good on the uh, responsibility side of that. But I really think about that as a similar idea, at least, to a treaty. And that, um, you know, the Creator said, you have this to use, enjoy, and continue your life with, but you have a responsibility to protect it. So to me, that's very much in line with the thinking of what a treaty ought to be. We also know that when our great law came to us and when our people worked through what that law was going to look like, that agreements were struck in that process. Um, there are some people who suggest that it took upwards of 40 years for the great law to be finished, to get everybody on board with this idea of giving up individual power in order to have collective strength. Um, I can't, I don't have time to go into all of that, but I know that you've had other opportunities um, to hear about that, and I know many of you have lots of knowledge of your own related to that. But I wanted to highlight three of uh, the wampum belts that are associated with the Great Law. Again, um, because to me, they, they fit in that spirit of what we think of as what treaties are supposed to be. The Ayanwatha belt, is 
the belt that symbolizes the joining together of our territories into a collective territory. I usually talk about this as a map of our homelands, but it's more than just a geographic map. It's a map of our interdependence and our interrelationships. And these days it's real popular on t-shirts um, as well as on flags that we might fly from um, our houses or on our cars or goodness knows where else. <laughs> but it's a symbol of our unity, right? And it's an agreement that our ancestors made for our benefit and a lesson to us that it's through this unity that we find the strength um, that's talked about in the law, that Gaza Stansar law comes from this joining together of our lands into a common territory. <coughs> the next belt that I wanted to mention from the great law is the circle wampum. And we know that these symbolize the original 50 titles of the Haudenosaunee, um, the Royane, the, uh, the chiefs. And it also speaks to the interdependence, again, of our families to each other. Another lesson that I was taught about this particular belt is that idea that we all have a place in the circle and that from that individual place or that our individual families' places, we have a different perspective because of where our families sit in that circle. But that you can't have the full picture of things until you have everybody's minds brought together. And so to me, this is, is really valuable in reminding us of the importance of, um, of that collective thinking and that opportunity for everyone to have a voice. And to me, that's one of the things that, that this carries and reminds us about. And again, to me, this is very much like a treaty in terms of our families, those original clan families, acknowledged that they were going to tie themselves together. And if you ever have the chance to look at either the original or a replica of this, the outside of that circle is two strands of wampum that are looped around each other. And then the 50 strings come inside from that. So we are literally tied together through this particular agreement that built um, the law. And then the third one that I like to talk about is um, the dish with one spoon, the original dish with one spoon, not the one that's been sort of borrowed um, extensively in this part of the world in the last uh, many years. But the original agreement and you find it, if you ever had the chance, I don't know if Heather brought it today, but um, there's a really great book that can be a little bit intimidating um, that I believe is at De Yohahage that's called Concerning the League. And it's this big white book. It's almost the size of one of these binders. Um, and it's in primarily the Onondaga language. Uh, and that text was produced probably about 30 years ago now, but the original that it's based upon was a narrative that was collected in this community, I think around 1911, maybe 1909, um, by a Seneca Hoyane, uh, John Arthur Gibson, who recited the story of the coming of the peacemaker to an anthropologist named Alexander Goldenweiser. And in that text, there's this beautiful narrative about the story of the coming of the law. And it can be a bit um, difficult for folks who aren't familiar either with linguistics <laughs> or just um, the archaic way in which uh, anthropologists tended to translate our languages in the early 20th century. Um, it can feel a bit like Shakespeare even at times, I think, when you're, you're reading the, the transliteration of it. But there's so much in that story, and I really encourage people um, if you haven't had the chance to spend some time with that text because there's so much in there that you might not even realize is included in the great law. 
um, and lots of aspects of it that tie it to our other epic narratives, including the creation story, the story of the four ceremonies, and then later to the Gaihuyo. Um, so really encourage folks, when you have spare time, which I know probably nobody has a lot of, but when you have some, check that out because there's some really amazing work in there. And that's, to me, that's one of the, um, I think the best done texts in that way. There's lots of them. Um, if you're either a, a, a geeky, geekly inclined history person or a geekly inclined linguistics person, um, you'll be really excited with that. But there's just a lot of really cool information in there. And it's worth it even just to spend, you know, read a few pages because you will learn something. Something will likely connect that you've heard in some other context. Um, anyway, in there, there's this discussion about um, once all of the leaders agreed to come together to form the Confederacy, the peacemaker instructed them that they needed to seal this agreement with a feast. And it was to be a feast of a, a stew made from beaver tail. And that there should be no sh sharp objects at the time of eating it, and that you were sharing it out of a single um, dish or bowl. And the idea was that you didn't want any sharp objects so that you could potentially accidentally cut someone. So it's that idea about having to be peaceful with each other, to not cause harm to each other, but also to share collectively in the bounty of creation. So it, it ties us all the way back to the creation story, but it also speaks particularly, if we want to put it into contemporary terms, it talks about a common economy. So we know that the ways in which we feed our families is our economy. These days, lots of us feed our families through some jobs. Lots of folks here are employees, right, of Polytechnic or somewhere else, and many of us are on the clock, so to speak. That's our economy, right? But this is the original economy. And what the peacemaker was telling us is that by coming together in our confederacy, we were agreeing to a shared economy. Um, now, mind you, most of us are quite entrenched in the capitalistic economy these days. It's difficult not to be, to be honest. However, this is a lesson that that needs to be at the very least moderated in the sense that we have this primary obligation first and foremost to a collective economy. And I think we all could learn um, to be a bit better about that collective economy than, than we have been. <clears throat> so when I hear about the dish, this is what I think about, is this agreement that we came to at the time of the great law. Um, but the ideas of it, of course, we were happy to build into other agreements that we made later. Uh, and so we'll talk about that a bit as well. So that next category that I mentioned earlier were these ideas of internation treaties. Um, and I brought here three uh, images of three belts that commemorate some of those agreements. Now one, it's a little bit, it's not exactly fitting in this category. It's what you might call a transition um, type of treaty because it's the one in the middle which is referred to as the Six Nations Belt or the Tuscarora Belt. It's what we call a rafter belt and you'll see these diagonal lines. Um, if you have the opportunity to study different kinds of wampum belts you'll find that there's lots of these rafter belts that have existed um, that have been used for different purposes. In many cases, we don't know the full stories of all of them, but this particular belt we know was created at the time that the Tuscarora Nation joined the Confederacy. And the reason they call it a rafter belt is because it's talking about extending the rafters of our longhouse, talking about that collective longhouse, that metaphorical longhouse that our nations agreed to live within and adding on to it. And that's one of the beauties um, about the longhouse style of architecture is you are able to add on to it. And you do it by extending the rafters. You add, literally add on to the end of the house um, and you make it longer. 
but it's still one house. And that's what that belt talks about. So it's kind of a transitional belt in that way because the Tuscaroras at that time weren't officially part of our Confederacy. They, we knew they were our relatives. They spoke a language very similar to ours. And we have stories that at one time they lived amongst us as well before they moved to the South. But they weren't here when we founded the Confederacy. So they had to be added on, brought in and the rafters had to be extended for that purpose. And that particular agreement was made around 1722. The belt at the very top is a treaty that was made with the Wendat Confederacy. And it's dated to 1612. I'm not entirely sure how accurate that date is, but it's in the early 17th centuries at the latest. It's possibly older than that. Um, and it's speaking about an agreement of peace that was struck between the Wendat people and our people. Uh, we know that that didn't always um, stand after that particular time, but that still doesn't mean that the treaty f no longer existed. It just meant that there were issues that had come up. Um, and then the belt at the bottom is the uh, Haudenosaunee Anishinaabe Friendship Belt. And I've yet to find a date that seems to make sense for that. Um, I have spoken to some Anishinaabe folks who are historians of their traditional stories, and they estimate that it's at least somewhere around 1200 AD. So it's at least 800 years old. Um, and they tie it to a particular council that was held in Niagara Falls as part of their, it's documented in their migration story. So if you ever have the chance to see a book called the Mashomas book, mm -hmm. they document their migration story there that's told within their Medewin Lodge. And their second stopping place was Niagara Falls. And in that story, they talk about an agreement that was made with our people. They also talk about um, a bowl that they have um, that exists as uh, a, mem like, um, a mnemonic device, a memory of that event. And they say that that bowl um, was filled with water, but that it had no bottom to it. And that um, it was intended that the relationship would always be so peaceful so that the water was completely still. And that's um, what they recall about the agreement that our people struck at that time. And then we have this belt that um, also talks about this, this path of peace that would exist between our peoples. <coughs> now the hot topic um, type of treaty are those treaties that come out of the colonial era. Uh, and this is definitely what the Ontario school curriculum is talking about <laughs> when they're talking about treaties. Um, and so I, I wanted to list some of the really valuable, they're all valuable, but the really sort of big ones um, that exist between the Haudenosaunee and settler peoples. And particularly I wanted to provide a little bit of background in terms of how they tie together. Because um, I think a lot of times in curriculum, we like to again have nice neat little boxes and act as if things are separate from each other because it's easier to create lesson plans. <laughs> um, sometimes too, I don't, I'm not sure this is honestly the case, but we believe that kids learn better in these um, compartmentalized ideas. But the reality is that treaties are a lot more complex than nice little boxes um, allow us to explain them by. Um, and in fact, my friend Paul Williams talks about our treaty relationship as a river. And he uses that analogy of a river, um, particularly, well, I think because Paul likes water, most of us do, um, but also about the fact that rivers sometimes can be disrupted, but that doesn't mean the river doesn't exist anymore, right? We know if we look at the Grand, there's literally over 100 dams that have been built on that river um, in the last 250 years. But it's still a river. And it's still um, continuing, actually, in the instructions that were given to it at the time of creation, right? That it, it, is con it continues as the creator had intended, 
despite what humans have tried to do to, to alter that. Um, we, can change, we can change it a bit, we can even change the course sometimes, but the river is still the river. <coughs> so the first um, of our treaty agreements made with settler peoples uh, came in 1630, uh, 1613 with the Goswenta, which is also known as the Turo Wampum, and that was made with the Dutch people along the Hudson River near um, the contemporary city of Albany. They actually refer to it as um, Beavervik. I don't know, I assume that has something to do with beavers, but I'm not 100% sure about that. But that was what the Dutch referred to it as. And what's interesting about the Dutch is that they weren't so interested in setting up permanent um, settlements as they were about establishing trade relationships, right? <laughs> and really about, they did, they were in a long battle with the English for kind of world domination. And so this was another stop in that collection of territories. And so they wanted to add that to their collection. So they struck um, this arrangement with our leadership at that time. And of course, most of us are quite familiar with the, the understanding of what our people were agreeing to with that belt in terms of this idea of agreeing to live um, to, to travel together on the river of life and the idea of two separate vessels traveling down that river, one symbolized as the Haudenosaunee canoe and the other symbolized as the Dutch ship. And the idea that there would be a relationship between them but that we would forever remain separate. And in a moment I'll explain how the Dutch left but others came, but this symbol continues to be an important symbol for our people and it's also what we expect of settlers to uphold because we see this as their responsibility um, to explain their right to be here is about upholding this particular agreement and the tenets of that agreement particularly around the ideas of non-interference and that we would not meddle in the internal affairs of the other and to me, this is Haudenosaunee foreign policy, all the way up to the present day. Um, lots of you probably have family or friends on the other side of that not real border. Um, and you know that there were elections that were happening yesterday um, in different parts of the United States. And if you're on social media much and you're involved with any of the like multinational native social media groups, you know there was a huge push to get Native people to vote. And I'm not going to judge other folks with that, but what we've always been taught um, is this idea that we don't interfere in the internal politics of our treaty partner. Um, that doesn't mean we don't have an opinion about what they do, but that it's not our place to interfere in that. Um, and so this obviously came to mind a lot as I was seeing posts from um, my friends who were engaging in different ways with the US political system um, recently. And also understanding that their people have different uh, instructions than we have, but I know what our instructions are. And then, um, so as I mentioned, the Dutch had this long history of competition for really global supremacy against the English at that time. Now mind you, not long before that, the Spanish were in the mix of that as well. The French were always sort of hanging around too. Um, all of these, and it's funny, when you look at a, a, if you look at a globe, it's one really pretty small part of the world, right? That has this obsession at that time <laughs> with trying to control the whole thing. And they didn't even know what the whole thing looked like, right? <laughs> It's, it's pretty wild, but anyway, um, at this time, the Dutch and the, the English were really sort of the top contenders for that. Um, but in 1664, they struck an agreement with each other that basically the Dutch were like, okay, you can be the top dog as long as we get to keep some stuff. <laughs> and they, they struck a deal that saw the Dutch 
relinquish their um, connection to what they had called uh, new, like at that time, I guess it was New Amsterdam, but, um, and it became New York. <laughs> Um, as the English took over that particular European claim to this part of the world. And um, within weeks of that peace agreement between the Dutch and the English, the English sought to treaty with the Haudenosaunee. And they did so um, close to the same area where the original Turo agreement was struck at a place called Fort Orange, which later became basically um, Albany, the Albany area. I think it's officially Rensselaerville, Rensselaerville, I think is probably closer to where the actual fort was, but it's in the Albany area. So within weeks of the Dutch and English agreement, the English met with our leadership and made a treaty with our leaders that said that the English would take on all of the responsibilities that had been previously taken by the Dutch. So they were replacing the Dutch and accepting all responsibilities for what the Dutch had previously promised. So that's why the two row is still relevant <laughs> because the English said, we're going to uphold this. That's our promise to you. And there's another important provision in that particular treaty council because the English spoke about a war that was happening between the Haudenosaunee and they call them the River Indians, but it's probably the Mohicans, um, which were down on the Hudson River Valley as well, right? And in that treaty, they promised that should we lose that war with the River Indians, that they would compensate us for any loss of land. And that becomes a really important provision because we see it in other later treaties um, between us and the English. And it has a really important connection for us here at Oswege. 13 years later, there's another treaty. And mind you, I think there were some smaller treaties in between there as well, but there's a, a major treaty that happens 13 years later. And this is where the idea of the silver chain as a symbol of our relationship was first struck. It's the first time I've seen it in the treaty record, is in 1677. And there was a whole discussion about what symbol would be useful to talk about this special relationship between the English and the Haudenosaunee. And there were different suggestions made. Um, particularly one was this idea of a, a rope made from straw but somebody pointed out that, oh, that can break. And then somebody liked the idea of an iron chain because of its strength, right? And when we think about iron, we know that it's, it's strong. But then it was pointed out, iron can rust. And so the idea of a silver chain was put forward. And the rationale offered for that idea was that silver never rusts. But what we do know is that silver tarnishes. And so we get the metaphor of the need to polish the chain from that particular agreement. And it becomes a really valuable metaphor that our leaders regularly have reminded the English about since 1677. <laughs> this responsibility to regularly polish the chain. In other words, we need to have good communications. We need to make sure that we're upholding these promises we've made to each other, and we have to do that often, otherwise the chain tarnishes. And if it tarnishes, then it's no longer bright and it's no longer a good symbol of a healthy relationship. So jump ahead, actually 23 years, to 1700, and what you find is a series of meetings that were happening um, primarily around Montreal. And this is where the French are trying to weasel in and um, create their own sort of dominion in the New World, as they referred to it. 
And particularly, they were trying to secure prime trading relationships because of the market of beaver pelts in Europe. It's crazy what a fashion craze can do. Because honestly, it's not like um, you know, this was something that they needed to live. It was something they really liked. And they would make these fancy hats out of beaver pelts. And it took two beaver pelts to make this hat. And it was all the craze back in Europe. And so that's why they were here and that's why they were trying to um, negotiate exclusive trade relationships with different native nations in order to capitalize on the market for these beaver hats. And it wasn't just like, you know, some hat that looks like a beaver. Oh no, it's this whole crazy process of like steaming and um, all of these formings and stuff, right? And it's those, they call them like dandy hats. I didn't bother to put pictures, but you can look it up later. Um, but it was that fashion craze that inspired this whole thing. Um, and so the French were really keen to secure an exclusive trade relationship with as many native communities as they could. So they had upwards of s over 60 different indigenous nations who they met with in the summer of 1700 in Montreal. And they had a preliminary agreement that they struck. And our people were present for a lot of those conversations as well. They agreed that they would come back the next summer to finalize the relationship. And that's uh, what's known as the Great Peace of Montreal of 1701. And Canada loves that treaty. Um, I think in part because it's a French treaty. And I think they, they often like to celebrate it as a means of trying to keep the peace with the Francophone um, population in the country. Just an idea. I'm not 100% sure on that. I'm sure other historians would have other things to say about that. But um, there was a lot of pomp and circumstance in 2001, right, for the 300th anniversary of this treaty. Canada was all about promoting it. Uh, but at the same time, in the summer of 1701, the English were also hosting treaty conferences in Albany and also trying to firm up their hold on the beaver pelt trade. And as I mentioned, we had representation at both treaties. The French were always obsessed with the idea of exclusive trade relationships. The English weren't as obsessed with that. And, um, but they, they wanted it, but they weren't as obsessed with it. And so we had people at both agreements. And this particular treaty, the 1701 Beaver Hunting Grounds Treaty, also known as the Nanfan Treaty, Nanfan was the, the main negotiator on behalf of England at the time, <coughs> has some very important provisions that are relevant, particularly to those of us um, in this part of uh, Haudenosaunee territory. And that was the idea that our leaders were accepting that the English crown or the British crown, I think it became British by then, um, were taking responsibility to protect our interests forever in the beaver hunting grounds. And basically the beaver hunting grounds territory is all of the land surrounding Lake Erie on both, like on all sides of the lake, as well as the land to the north of Lake Ontario. So in other words, central and southern Ontario and the upper parts of the Ohio River Valley. Um, is the land that was referenced in this particular treaty. And the Crown promised to forever protect our interests in these lands. In exchange, of course, for our willingness to continue our economic trade of beaver pelts with the British. Now, shortly thereafter, lots of talk starts amongst uh, different representatives of the crown, where they had the idea that this meant it was a transfer of title. 
And if you happen to spend some time with the Sir William Johnson papers, which are online now, it's not like the old days where you had to like pull it out of a book. Um, Lauren's dad has the whole set in his office that he's pulled out for me many times. But now it's, it's online, it's also on a CD-ROM, although nobody uses CD-ROMs anymore, but I have it. Um, actually, maybe it's probably DVDs, because they look the same, right? I can never remember when I just look at it, which is which. But yeah, it's a 15 volume set of records that were the papers that were collected during the time that Sir William Johnson served as the Imperial Indian agent um, of Britain in, um, amongst our territories and amongst our people. <coughs> and in there you'll see lots of passages where Johnson and, and others remind their, um, their other, the people who report to them, the other military leaders, that the Haudenosaunee understanding was that this was not a transfer of land, that this was a promise of protection from the crown in exchange for our continued economic engagement in the fur trade. And that becomes highly relevant in a lot of conversations that are happening in this part of the world today. I want to jump forward just to quickly mention the Treaty of Niagara of 1764. You'll actually find several other treaties of Niagara, um, but the 1764 one is particularly relevant because in 1763, King George III issued what's known as the Royal Proclamation. Um, now, there's actually a lot of royal proclamations too, but the one of 1763 was the doozy that was actually the primary um, catalyst of what became the American Revolution because King George declared that the subjects of the crown were not going to impose on Indian lands and there was a line that's drawn and described in this declaration. And it's along, it's basically a, along the Appalachians. Um, and it said that individual subjects of the crown could not engage in um, taking possession of Indian land. That that was the sole authority of the crown to engage in those negotiations with native nations. And um, <clears throat> as you probably know, and have heard talked about in different ways, that didn't set so well with the um, many of the leaders of the colonies because they liked the idea of just taking whatever they wanted. Um, and I wouldn't suggest to you that the crown was opposed to that spirit, but they were opposed to people doing it on their own. They wanted to be in charge. Um, and that's really what the Royal Proclamation of 1763 was talking about However, that's just the king speaking to his subjects, right? He didn't have authority over us. And so the treaty in Niagara in 1764 was the agreement that was struck that affirmed those principles that were found in the Royal Proclamation. So this is the document that pertains to Native people, not the Royal Proclamation. Um, and there's lots, uh, there were, I think well over 20 nations that participated in the Treaty of Niagara. Um, and there are a number of different belts and things that were exchanged at that particular treaty. <coughs> and then I wanted to jump ahead just real quickly to a treaty that was struck in Burlington Bay in 1815. And I have um, images of that as well to share. And that was the treaty conference that was the official end of the War of 1812 as uh, it pertained to Haudenosaunee involvement with the war. So we all know the top image very well, also adorned on lots of t-shirts and, and other paraphernalia, sometimes flags as well. The middle image is a belt that talks about the covenant chain relationship. And so they'll talk about that as the covenant chain belt. And then this belt on the bottom, which looks quite different, right, from the other, certainly from these other two, but even from the other treaty belts that we saw um, from the great law belts. This one, they'll talk about it as a zigzag belt or um, a Greek key image. 
And it's definitely a different motif than what was typically found prior to this in Haudenosaunee wampum belts. And this is also sometimes referred to as the claws belt. Um, and he was one of the spokespeople for the, the, the British crown. <coughs> but this belt symbolizes what was agreed to at the, the Treaty of Burlington Bay, where the crown pledged to reinstate all of their former promises to the Haudenosaunee. And that despite um, whatever had, had happened during the War of 1812, that they were declaring their forever obligations to the Haudenosaunee as they had previously agreed to. And again, that's important when we think about the other treaties that we talked about really quickly. So I'm going to step back briefly <laughs> to um, the Fort Albany Treaty or the Beaver Hunting Grounds Treaty or the Nan Fan Treaty. Just to um, make a few points that are, are probably going to be useful to folks because there's all kinds of discussion about this happening. Um, whether you've had the opportunity to be involved with any of it yet or not, you undoubtedly will at some point. Um, and that obviously this treaty is talking about the land where we're at. Um, the Grand River Valley falls solidly within the beaver hunting grounds. Um, if you haven't ever noticed it before, there's some really cool images down the hall of um, an early geographic map that shows the territory talked about in that treaty. I think it's just around the corner, right? Yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a pretty neat image. I didn't bother to copy it into here because I knew that folks would have access to it in the hallway. <coughs> I included, though, the image of um, the dish with one spoon belt. And I included that because we have an earlier understanding about what our responsibilities are to this territory. And, of course, we have an understanding that we already, this was already our territory. It's important for us to know, as Oswege Hono, that none of these treaties with settler peoples gave us anything. We already had this. And it's a little bit more complicated <laughs> in the sense of this part of the world because we know that it wasn't the original five nations typically living in this part of the world um, at, at that particular time. We certainly hunted in this area, but we didn't have permanent villages in this area. There were relatives of ours, however, who did previous to that point. And they, um, they're talked about as the neutral nation. Um, there's other names that are used for them, Adewanderon. The Onondate, although the Onondate are, are a bit further north. Um, but we know that through both the skirmishes that happened around the beaver trade, as well as, and, and to a much greater extent, I believe, um, the result of epidemic disease, most of those people either died and the ones who survived came to live amongst us. Um, and they settled particularly amongst Seneca and Cayuga villages in our homelands territory. And I think probably for different reasons, I think primarily amongst the Cayuga people, which is a bit interesting because they're not immediately neighbors, right, to here. But um, it appears that probably most of the, the neutral families who survived those plagues ended up amongst Cayuga villages. Um, in the homelands territory. And that's important to know as well. <clears throat> so again, as I mentioned, this agreement in 1701, our leaders were placing our interests in this territory and in all of the beaver hunting grounds under the protection of the crown. And it was based upon this idea that the crown would forever protect our interests we know, of course, they wanted to protect our interests because they wanted our hunters to continue to feed their, their fashion industry, right? But um, for us, we knew that there were other things we could get out of that, particularly around this idea of affirming our rights to this territory. 
And again, it's important to remember this was not a surrender. And that is highly relevant. Now, I, I included another image here. I'm not sure if everyone can see it. Um, we don't know for certain what belt or belts sealed this particular treaty. Um, there's a theory, however, that it very well may be this belt here on the bottom. And this belt is currently housed at the British Museum in London. And um, if you don't have any knowledge of the British Museum, they're very famous for the fact they don't give stuff back. <laughs> um, there was actually a really interesting uh, sort of comedy segment that was produced about this last week maybe um, that's really hilarious, but also like devastatingly true in terms of the position of the British Museum. And they've stolen stuff from all over the world. It's certainly not just us. And in many cases, the stuff of ours that they have, they don't even really know what it is. Um, because this particular belt is actually labeled in some of their files as Delaware. Um, I'm pretty sure that's not accurate. It seems like the reason they might have labeled that, and I found out, because I had the chance to visit there last summer, that that label was attached to it in the 1970s. Some expert came through and consulted on the collection, and he put forward the idea of this being a Delaware belt. Now, at one time, this belt was listed as uh, Sioux, and they thought it came from the plains. <laughs> um, they're not the best record keepers, <laughs> despite what they might want you to believe. Um, <clears throat> but it's... I can tell you it's amazing in terms of the fact that this belt is most likely at least 300 years old and in pristine condition. Um, and I'm pretty sure for lots of different reasons that this is a Haudenosaunee belt. Whether or not it's the 1701 belt, I'm not sure. Um, it would make sense and it particularly makes sense because there's this little attachment on the strands of the belt. Um, and it's been described in their, their record as a turtle, but it's not a turtle. I'm pretty sure it's a beaver. Um, the head is missing. Not really shocking if you know much about museum stuff, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a beaver based upon the opportunity to look at it up close. <coughs> but I've also never ever seen an attachment like this Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of things that would make sense, I think, for when we apply our minds to it. Um, <clears throat> but it's, yeah. So I'm not quite sure what's going to happen with this particular belt. There are also, like, a whole bunch of other things in their collection that, again, aren't, like, super fancy and museum ideas but that are really valuable, I think, to our people. So there's gonna be some conversations happening. Um, I don't know how far we'll get with those, but I don't think, um, you know, if you spoke to our people 50 years ago that they would have expected they would have gotten back a number of other things, right? Like, quickly, I'll show you. <laughs> All right, maybe we could do a challenge. And you know what? If they televised it, they could make way more money. Um, so the original of this belt was held by the New York State Museum until the 1980s. So 50 years ago, I don't think many of our people had a lot of hope that we would see some of these most valued items come back to us. So hopefully um, it won't take another 50 years for this to come back. But if it does, that's okay, because there'll be people here to take it, right, to get it back. Um, there were lots of jokes about distractions while we were there um, to see if, <laughs> but this, this is in storage, so it wasn't even at the main museum site where I got to see it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. And then just so many things, right? If you haven't had a chance to visit a museum and particularly to visit the stacks, I encourage you to do so.
but make sure you consult with people who know things to make sure you're protected when you do that. <coughs> so I mention this, um, and not to, to sort of stir up anything in particular, but we do know that um, <coughs> currently there's some matters in the courts of Canada that pertain to this and pertain to more broadly our land rights <coughs> in the Grand River Valley and, and throughout the beaver hunting grounds. And there's a lot of different thinking about um, what we ought to be doing about that. And it's not my place to tell you what to think about that, but I encourage you to learn as much as you can about that so that you're making an informed decision about what you believe and about what position you take with that. Um, I will say that I don't think any of the cases that are currently in the courts best represent our collective understandings of our history. Um, I know people are making solid attempts at that and they're doing their individual best, but we haven't had that opportunity to put forward our collective best about that. And I'm not sure what's gonna happen before we have that, that opportunity to do that, but <clears throat> if you all work on your individual learning, then we'll collectively be stronger to do that when the opportunity arises. <coughs> um, and if you don't know, I, I will mention, so there's a number of claims that have been put forward by the Mississaugas of the Credit, um, including an argument of um, exclusive rights to um, what they call their homelands, but that we know were their homelands for a rather short period of time. Not to say that didn't mean that they didn't have a longer historic relationship with the territory, but they weren't, they didn't have permanent villages in this part of the world um, for very long before they started making land sessions. <coughs> um, so that's, there's a number of cases that their lawyers have put forward. Um, Six Nations elected band council has um, our land claims cases going to court in uh, Canadian courts starting in the new year. Uh, mind you, those cases were first filed in 1987, but that was not the first time our people notified Canada or notified the Crown that there were issues. It goes all the way back to, at the very least, here, um, 1787. And quite honestly, we have claims that go back to 1693 in the Mohawk Valley. Um, so we have a longer history of land claims than Canada does as a country of existing, right? Um, so when we think about what the true law of the land is, it's, it's far older than the Dominion of Canada. <coughs> um, and then the other, there's currently a, recently a challenge that's been issued by the Haudenosaunee Development Institute against the Band Council um, claim as the sole authority for the land claims case. So it's, it's messy, it's complicated, and uh, it's not pretty, but it affects everybody. Um, and actually, whether you're Haudenosaunee or not, if you live here, it affects you too. Um, <coughs> and that's what they're not teaching in the treaty curriculum in Treaty Week in Ontario schools. <laughs> um, I do have a couple of sources uh, to encourage people if they wanna look at, into things a bit more or some of the particulars that I spoke to. <coughs> the first is the wampum section in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy website. Um, there's some real good information there, particularly about stuff I didn't touch on as it relates to the great law and some of the other belts that play a really prominent role in the great law. The second one is, it must be like a, a presentation that Rick Hill did for the AFN, because it shows up on an AFN website. Um, but it's looking specifically at the Fort Niagara Treaty of 1764. He's got a lot of really cool images in there in particular. So I encourage you to check that out if you have some time. And then the third one is uh, from the Onondaga Nation website. And they've got some really nice, concise information about treaties as well. Um, interestingly enough, 
the um, Oneida of the Thames Band Council has been promoting both the Confederacy website and the Onondaga Nation website in their treaty education information. Um, I'm not sure if Martin is, is being cheeky with that, um, but uh, so Martin Paulus is the, um, a lawyer who works for the band council at Oneida. But Oneida is a little bit different, right, in terms of sort of their relationship between their band council and their, um, their traditional council. But yeah, I, th I thought that was interesting. Lots of very interesting stuff popping up on social media. I only do Facebook, so I'm limited in terms of what I'm seeing, but I, I'm sure there's lots of cool stuff coming out. I hope it's at least tasteful if it's coming out on TikTok. Um, <coughs> I know there's a lot of good stuff there. I just don't have the time. Um, I think Instagram, there's, there's been some really interesting stuff there too. Twitter is too easy to fall into a rabbit hole, but, um, and I'm not sure if folks want to continue to support Elon Musk, but that's a whole other conversation. So that's what I have for today. I'm happy to take questions. I'm not sure how much time we have left. We're two minutes past. So um, I'm happy to stick around, though, and answer questions that folks might have. Good network, thank you. Yeah.